This will be a summary lecture of the Chapter 15 Chemical Equilibrium Notes that I do in my AP Chemistry class. The first slide deals with an example of a common equilibrium that is used a lot. Um, we have the compound N2O4, which is a colorless substance, and then it decomposes into a brown substance, nitrogen dioxide. And so there's an equilibrium that actually um, sets up where you have a colorless compound turning into a colorful brown compound and uh, the equilibrium is shown with a double arrow and each is constantly being formed at the same rate at equilibrium and so there's always some N2O4 disappearing and there's always some um, N2O4 being formed so the forward reaction and reverse reaction are still going on and so it's called a dynamic equilibrium. Now in my PowerPoint I say that there's a colorless frozen N2O4 compound but in the equation it says that it's a gas. It doesn't really matter. There's still an equilibrium between a colorless substance and a, and a colorful substance which is the brown gas uh, nitrogen dioxide. And so this chemical equilibrium is defined as the point at where the concentrations of the gases or the substances in the reaction are constant. It's not that the reaction has stopped, it's that the forward reaction is occurring at the same rate as the reverse reaction. So the concentrations are not changing. On the next slide we discuss um, the equilibrium constant and how that is determined. And so I, here's another general example of a reaction where substance A and B react together to form substance C and D. And there's two reactions going on again because there's an equilibrium. It's the forward and reverse reaction. And at equilibrium you can write the rate of the forward reaction with our rate expression that we did in the previous chapter. And the reverse reaction is written basically the same way. And at equilibrium, since the rates of the forward reaction and reverse reaction are equal to one another, you can set the rate laws equal to one another. And then you can rearrange the equation and you end up getting what's called the equilibrium expression. And the important thing about this slide is that you're always taking the products divided by the reactants. So the concentration of the products raised to their exponents, um, which is from the balanced chemical equation, divided by the reactants. So it's always products over reactants raised to whatever their stoichiometry powers are. And the K is a capital K and it's called the equilibrium constant. Now if substances in the reaction are gases, then the concentrations are proportional to their partial pressures. So you can express um, the equilibrium constant in terms of concentrations, which is the unit of molarity, or you can change them into pressures. So you could have the pressures of the gases C and D, if they were indeed gases, divided by the pressures of the substances A and B if they were gases. And again, they're raised to their stoichiometry powers. And if you want to convert from molarity to pressure, you can use the formula PV equals nRT. And the actual value for K is determined experimentally at a specific temperature for a very specific reaction, so it does the K value will change with temperature. And here are some facts about equilibrium constants, and there's several slides of these, so there's a lot of them. The equilibrium constant does not depend on the initial concentrations of the reactants or products, since we're only worried about equilibrium concentrations. Um, so here's a, an experiment where you change the pressure of the N2O4 and the initial pressure of the NO2 and your equilibrium partial pressures are established and you and when you take the products divided by the reactant pressures you still get the same general uh, equilibrium constant. It's always around 6.45. Now if you have a large K that means that more products are going to be present at equilibrium so if K is much much greater than 1 then you're going to have the reaction um, it still reaches an equilibrium, but there's going to be a heck of a lot more products than reactants, and the converse is true as well. So if you have a small K value, that means you mostly have reactants at equilibrium. Now the magnitude of equilibrium constants is just shown here. If you have a large K, there's mostly products at equilibrium. If you have a small K, there's mostly reactants at equilibrium. So it's just a visual representation of what I just described. Here's some more facts about K. Um, the equilibrium constant for reaction in the reverse direction is just the inverse of the equilibrium constant. So instead of having N2O4 turning into 
in O2 if you switched it um, and had the two NO2 molecules at equilibrium with N2O4, then you would just do one over the equilibrium constant. And again, this is specific This is specific for a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. Now, the equilibrium constant does not depend on the mechanism for the reaction, so um, you don't have to worry about the steps of the chemical reaction. That's more of a, a rate law um, idea, which is kinetics, not equilibrium. And the value of K does change with temperature. And the stoichiometry of a reaction that has been multiplied by a number changes the equilibrium constant. So basically, if you double the chemical equation um, from a 1 to 2 ratio to a 2 to 4 ratio, you can get a new equilibrium constant just by squaring your old equilibrium constant. So whatever you multiply a reaction by, you're going to have the exponent on the K value uh, be raised to that power. Now the equilibrium constant for a net reaction made up of two or more steps is the product of the equilibrium constant. So basically if you have two reactions and you add them up using Hess's law, you can take the K values of the first reaction times the K value of the second reaction. So when you add chemical reactions, you actually can multiply Ks together. And if you write these, um, if you write these values in terms of their uh, stoichiometry, you would have the concentration of C times the concentration of D, which are the products, divided by the concentration of A, and the concentration of B is squared, because again, there's a 2 in the balanced chemical equation. So this is just showing, again, the products divided by the reactants raised to the power. Now, K is usually uh, not written with units, or it's never written with units, and it's um, kind of hard to explain this, but basically, whenever you have a concentration, um, it's compared to or based on a standard concentration of one molar or if you have a pressure it's based on the standard pressure of one atmosphere so technically you're taking a concentration divided by one molar and then the units cancel out or you have a pressure that you're plugging into an equilibrium expression you have to divide it by one atmosphere before you plug the number into the equation so um, basically I just tell the students don't worry about K units because they don't have any. Here's some more facts if concentrations are used, they usually call it K sub C. The little C stands for concentrations, so if you're using aqueous solutions, you'd call it a KC value, but it's still an equilibrium constant. If you're using gases and you have to use pressures, then you usually call it a KP. So the little subscript uh, changes often when you're doing equilibrium problems using aqueous solutions or gaseous solutions, and there's other little subscripts that will appear in later chapters like Ka values or Kb values for acids and bases, and there's a Kw value for water, and uh, things like that, or a Ksp, which is a solubility product that we do in, in a later chapter, but the basic point is, is that don't freak out when you see the little subscript changing, it's still an equilibrium constant. Now, equilibrium expressions only contain concentrations of gases or aqueous substances, never solids or liquids, because the concentrations of solids and liquids don't change in the reaction. So they're basically uh, constant. So the concentration of a solid or a pure liquid doesn't change, so you don't have to worry about it in an equilibrium expression. So if you had this reaction of calcium carbonate um, at equilibrium with calcium oxide and carbon dioxide, the only substance that affects the equilibrium is the CO2 gas. And so you'd write the equilibrium expression as the product, which is the CO2 pressure, and it's not divided by anything because there isn't any reactants. Now, it's very important you guys understand that to be at equilibrium, you do have to have the solids present, but they're not going to affect the the equilibrium or the, the pressure of the CO2. So in the first picture you have a lot of calcium oxide and a little bit of calcium carbonate. If you were to remove some calcium oxide and put in a whole bunch of calcium carbonate, you would still have the same pressure of the carbon dioxide. The only way you can shift the equilibrium, if these systems are at equilibrium, and we're assuming that they are, uh, the only way you can shift the equilibrium is by adding or removing the CO2 gas from the container. So solids or pure liquids do not affect equilibrium concentrations, but they do have to be present in order for the equilibrium to be established. So um, if you were to take out all of the calcium carbonate, the system would not be at equilibrium. So you could have movement that way, but um, the only thing that would affect the equilibrium when the system is at equilibrium is the carbon dioxide.
Now, Le Chatelier's principle talks about shifting the equilibrium. So if you apply a stress to a system that's already at equilibrium, that's already at balance, then the equilibrium will shift to reduce the effect of the stress. Now, it might not be able to reduce all of the stress, but it will shift to relieve some of the stress. And we're going to look at different ways of applying a stress to a system that's at equilibrium and to see how Le Chatelier's principle will be used to, to see if the reaction is going to shift to the forward or to the reverse reaction. So, the first thing you can do is change a concentration of a reactant or a product. If you add more of substance A, then that's going to speed up the forward reaction, and so we say that it shifts to the right. As this occurs, the amount of C and D will increase, and the amount of B will decrease. And um, once equilibrium is established, you still have the forward um, and reverse reactions occurring at the same rate. But the uh, concentrations of A and B and C and D might have changed, but you can still do the products over reactants, and it's going to stay as a constant value at the given temperature. So here's some more information about how concentrations affect equilibriums. If you take out substance C, if you decrease the concentration in C, then the system will shift to replace C. So A and B will decrease, the reaction shifts to the right, and substance D will increase. So again, once again, the, uh, the system will reach equilibrium, and then the K equilibrium value will be the same, even though the concentrations have been altered. Now for number two, the second way you can change or apply a stress to an equilibrium is by changing the pressure. And pressure only affects chemical reactions which involve gases. So if the pressure of a system increases, then the substances basically get compressed, and you can consider their concentrations increasing. So if the pressure goes up, you can consider that as a concentration going up. And so the reaction um, will try to reduce the number of molecules per liter. And if you want to change the pressure, if you want to make the pressure go up, a way of doing that is by decreasing the volume, and that's Boyle's Law. So if the pressure goes up, the volume goes down. So here's some uh, Here's an example of changing the pressure. So if you increase the pressure on this equilibrium situation, then the system is going to try to decrease the number of molecules. So if the pressure goes up by making the volume go down, then the way to relieve that stress is by decreasing the number of molecules. And so if you look at the balanced equation, there's two moles of gases uh, two moles of hydrogen gas on the left, and there's one mole of oxygen gas on the left, so for the grand total of three moles on the left, and there's only two moles of water vapor on the right side, so the, sh the equilibrium is going to shift to the right to get less gas molecules, so it's going to reduce from three to two. Now, if the number of gas particles on both sides happens to be the same, let's say it's two moles on the left and two moles of gas on the right, then changing the pressure won't have any effect on the equilibrium. If you add an inert gas, like, let's say, um, neon gas in the container, since it's not part of the equilibrium expression, it will not change the equilibrium. And the third thing that you can do is change the temperature. And so all chemical reactions either give off heat or they take in heat, so they're exothermic or endothermic. And if you increase the temperature, that's going to favor the endothermic reaction, and if you decrease the temperature, that's going to favor the exothermic reaction. And we look at an example on the next page. Now, as you change the temperature, not only will the reaction shift, but it'll actually change the value of the equilibrium constant. So we're just going to focus on the shifting of the equilibrium on the next page. So this example is an exothermic reaction. We have hydrogen and iodine turning into um, HI. And another way of looking at the reaction being exothermic is by putting heat as a product. And so if you lower the temperature, that's like removing the heat, so the reaction will shift to the right to replace the heat you just took out of there. Now there's Van Hoff's law, which is defined as if a system is at equilibrium, if you in, an increase in heat energy is displaced so that heat is absorbed. That is basically an explanation of Le Chatelier's principle for a very specific situation where temperature is changed. So you don't have to worry about Van Hoff's law because everybody just calls it Le Chatelier's principle. Now a catalyst, um, surprisingly enough, uh, does not affect an equilibrium.
situation. So if a reaction is at equilibrium and you throw in a catalyst, all it does is it speeds up the forward and reverse reaction, but it's not going to shift to the left or to the right. So it doesn't affect the equilibrium constant if you're already at equilibrium. And so here's a visual representation of it. A catalyst lowers the activation energy, but your forward and reverse reaction are occurring faster, but it's still at the, um, the same equilibrium. Now, if you want to predict the direction of a reaction, you have to calculate something called the reaction quotient, which is Q. And Q is exactly like K, but K has equilibrium values from the reaction plugged into it. Q is not necessary to add equilibrium, but you still have the same formula products over reactants. So K is products over reactants, Q is products over reactants. And all you need to do is figure out if K is bigger or smaller than Q, or if Q is bigger or smaller than K. So if Q is larger than K, that means you have too many products, and so the reaction is going to proceed back to the left. And if um, Q is too small, that means you don't have enough products, so the reaction will proceed in the forward direction. And we do some example problems in the notes um, or in practice problems in class together to calculate Q and compare it to K. And here's a visual representation of it on this slide. So here you have a small Q compared to K, and so the reaction goes to the right. If you have a large Q, it goes back to the left. Now we're doing a practice problem calculating the equilibrium constant. And the technique that we're going to use for all equilibrium calculations is something called the ice box. It stands for the initial change and equilibrium conditions of the reaction. So it spells I-C-E, and, and you tabulate the data in, a, in this format. So if you read the question, you can figure out that the initial concentration of the PCL5 molecule is 0 .0087 moles per liter. Um, I made it easy because it's a one liter container, so whatever the moles is, the concentration is that way. Now these are gases, but I'm going to use concentrations in this formula. And again, if you wanted to change from um, moles per liter to atmospheres, you could use the PV equals NRT formula if you wanted to. But I'm just going to use molarity in this formula right now. So we're going to calculate the, the K value in uh, mol using molarities. Now the initial pressure of the PCL3 is 0.298 molar but there isn't any chlorine in the reaction vessel yet, so the reaction's going to have to proceed to the right uh, in order to establish an equilibrium. And so the amount that the PCL5 changes is just going to be given a value. Um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I had that wrong. At equilibrium, it actually tell us how much CO2 gas is in the container, and that's uh, 0 0.02 moles. So how much did the chlorine gas change? Well, it changed by this value, and we kind of tabulated on the next slide. So the value that it changed was it increased by 0 0.002 moles per liter. So if the chlorine gas goes up by 0 0.002 moles per liter, then the PCL3 also has to go up by 0 0.002 moles per liter, and the PCL5 is going to decrease by that amount because they're all in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one mole ratio. And so once you have the initial conditions tabulated and you've figured out how much the change is, you can just take the initial plus the change and that equals the equilibrium values. So for the PCL5 substance we have 0 .0087 plus a negative 0 .002 and so the equilibrium concentration is going to only be 0 0.0067, and then the PCL3 concentration is going to be at 0 0.300. I kind of ignored some of the sig fig units, but you can still understand the calculation. Now the whole point of this is to calculate the K value. So we have the three equilibrium concentrations now, and we can plug those into our equilibrium expression, and we do that on the next slide. So we have all of our values, and we know that the uh, products divided by the reactants looks like that, and then the concentrations are plugged into the equation, and we end up getting a value of around 0 0.09, and again, there isn't any units. Now, this system of tabulating data will allow you to solve for equilibrium concentrations if you're given K, just like if you know uh, the K, you can find equilibrium concentrations. And so we're going to do another example, <coughs> excuse me, where we know the K value, and we're going to um, go back and calculate 
the uh, equilibrium concentrations. So it tells us that the initial concentrations of hydrogen is 0.2 and the iodine is 0.2 and there isn't any HI and so the reaction has to proceed to the right to reach equilibrium and the H and the I molecule are going to be decreasing by a value of X and so they change by minus X and minus X but then the HI molecule has a 2 in front of it from the balanced equation so it's actually going to increase by a value of 2X and so at equilibrium we add the initial and the change columns and so we have 0.2 minus x and 0.2 minus x and just plain old 2x. So these are the values that we're going to plug into our equilibrium expression and again our equilibrium expression will be the products over the reactants raised to their um, stoichiometry uh, coefficients. And so here's the equilibrium expression. We have HI squared divided by H and divided by the I concentration and we already knew the K value was 64 and then we plug in the expression 2x and that's squared and then you have the point 2 minus x and another point 2 minus x. Now it's going to uh, involve some nasty algebra skills and you might even have to use the quadratic equation but I made this problem a little easier because both sides are perfect squares so you can take the square root of the left and the square root of the right and then the equation gets simplified and because this is just a practice problem I don't need to go through the math of solving it but you basically get an x value of 0 0.160 uh, moles per liter or molarity. But that's not the answer to our question. We wanted to figure out what the equilibrium concentrations are so you have to go back to your equilibrium icebox and plug in X in the equilibrium row and you end up having 0.2 minus the 0.16 and then for the HI you have two times the X value and so those are your concentrations. Now I highly suggest that you plug those back into your equilibrium expression to make sure they actually equal 64. So if you plug in the values and um, calculate it, it does equal 64. There might be some rounding involved but it's close enough to 64 um, so you know you did the algebra right. So again if you know the concentrations you can calculate K and if you know K you can calculate the concentrations and these are the standard equilibrium calculations that you'll have to do. Now we're uh, at the end of the PowerPoint we do a lot of examples and we do a lab calculating the K. So that's basically a quick summary of chapter 15, General Equilibrium.